Hey everybody, welcome to the fourth in a series of videos counting down my favorite 50 games of all time. Today we're gonna do number 20 down to number 11. So let's just go ahead and jump right into it. We got one more to go after this one. So the number 20 game is a game called Cryptid. Now this is a game that just came out last year. This is a deduction game. It's not a social deduction game, although it is a very social deduction game. Uh, what this is, is uh, players are trying to find the cryptid. They're trying to find Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster or some kind of uh, creepy thing or some treasure or something. It's very abstract, but each player is given one part of a clue to find the one spot on the board that is a legal spot for to satisfy each player's clue. So you need to go like a third or a fifth of the puzzle. The game plays three to five players. And then through uh, questions and answers and a little bit of guesswork, you can try to find and go and search the one spot that is the right spot and then be the winner of the game. So there's just a round after round of questions and answers. Uh, players are putting cubes out for no answers and discs out for yes answers. And you're trying to use all of your cognition and your deductive skills to figure out what it is before everybody else. Uh, the board and everything looks gorgeous. I like how the cubes and the discs look on the game. Uh, I, uh, so I might be slightly biased with this game. I almost hesitate to mention this, but I'm not like super good at many games. I seem to be super good at this game. I once won this three times in a row, no problem, easy on the game night. And uh, one time I actually won it on the first turn in a five player game. Uh, everybody puts out some markers to kind of seed the board to start the game. And then it was one round of questions and I was the fifth player and I searched and won the game. Uh, so sometimes I can get in the zone with this game. I don't win like every single time I play it obviously, but something about this game really kind of uh, molds itself to the way I think and deduce things, I guess. Uh, the thing that I really like about it is, as opposed to other deduction games where, like I think of the, the primal example is Sleuth, which came out in like the 70s or the 60s, and most deduction games are based on that. That's an old six, that Sid Saxon design, and you're kind of just doing process of elimination. And a lot of deduction games I don't really like because it's just process of elimination and you can do some inference, you know, a little bit of that and then, you know, reduce your, uh, your possibilities as you go. This one, there's something about because it's so visual and spatial and you, there's a certain intuitiveness that I feel that the game has and that's kind of why I brought up why I seem to be good at it because I played it with most people seem to like it, but not everybody really likes this game. Uh, and it was a complete dud with the family, and I thought maybe it would be perfect, but it just was a complete, fell flat. Uh, and so I think there's something about this game for me that I'm able to intuit, and uh, you know, there's definitely other players on this planet that are able to do it as well, uh, where I'm able to make a hunch. Now a lot of times in these games, like even the detective games, escape room games, anything that's kind of a puzzle, I don't really feel the hunch part of it come out that much. Whereas this one, there are certain moments where you can really make a spring and say, okay, I know Billy, Francesca, and Frankie's you know, thing, I'm pretty sure that I'm locked in, I know what mine is, and because I know what mine is, this is really the important part of the game, because I know what, what my clue is, like your clue actually turns out to be the most important clue because you know for certain, and then as you get more certainty from the other players, you can then sort of pivot your clue off of the, some of the other players you're not super sure about, like you have an idea what they're out, and then that will just spin it down and lock it in. Now that's still kind of process of elimination, but for some reason it feels a little bit more like a gut feeling. It feels more like an intuition, and I like how it kind of plays uh, with that kind of vibration for me. Uh, so there's something that really, I just really kind of draws me to uh, Cryptid. So let's talk about player count. It plays three to five players, like I said. I would play any player count, absolutely, any day of the week. Uh, the, the game time is going, well, like I said, I'm thinking I won it on my first turn, so that game took like five minutes. And so I've been able to win games quickly. Uh, so, you, so if you have someone at the table that seems to be pretty good at you can get a game done in 10 or 15 minutes. Usually the games can go about a half an hour or so, but not really much more than that. Uh, the, you can get kind of stumped. Everybody can get a little bit stumped and stuff. And also like the way that you answer questions is also really cool about this. So a lot of times other deduction games, it's a yes or no thing. And that's what this is, it's yes or no. 
but sort of sometimes like how you ask the questions and how you answer yes or no and that kind of stuff, that's hard to explain without going through the rules. But the way that that operates is also a weird kind of, you get in this kind of fuzzy logic thing. Uh, so uh, definitely recommend Cryptid 100%. The other game, and it's also a recent game that came out last year, is uh, it's a word game, it's called Decrypto. And that's a very, very fun game that is sort of like code names sort of amped up a little bit. And I don't want to get too much in details of that, but that one also, there's some good sort of fuzzy guessing and fuzzy logic and leaps of logic and stuff like that that happens in Decrypto. So if you look at this and you get a chance to play this maybe and you like it kind of falls flat for you, definitely I would say maybe give Decrypto a shot because it's also an excellent game and has some of those same feelings for me. Uh, so that is Decrypted number 20. So we're gonna go to number uh, 19 here. And this is a little bit bigger of a box. And this is Kill Team from uh, Games Workshop. It's a Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team. Completely different game than Decrypted. Uh, and this is a small skirmish uh, miniatures game set in the 40K universe. Was a big splash uh, come out. Was it last year or the year before? It's It's been out for a little while, at least over a year probably. Uh, this for me is the way to play 40K. Uh, so the 40K world or universe has some interesting uh, funky aspects to it. Some very heavy metal, uh, uh, gothic horror stuff and some real just awkward things that happens and it's just a crazy fascist, fascist, cystic? fascist is a good word universe of these crazy alien races and the humans aren't super hot and it's a very much a dystopian far-flung future obviously warhammer 40,000, and it's very dystopian like it would suck i wouldn't want to live there um and so you've got your whole funky models and and just wacky sci-fi with like a, a mashup of a lot of pop culture sort of turned through the 40k machine to kind of come out the other side with this just wacky dark comic kind of uh, vibe and then you know you're able to get in there and play a really cool solid uh, skirmish miniature game uh, this, I think, well, well I mean, we may talk some more about this as we get higher up and maybe the next video, but this to me is one of the most solid uh, miniature game designs and it's really balanced for uh, narrative play, for kind of a role playing aspect as well as like competitive play. And, and so you've got your, your basic mechanics, you move the guys around, you roll dice for hits, you roll dice for wounding and saves and, and maybe special abilities or, or spells or, or psychic abilities and stuff like that. So you've got kind of all your, your trappings, moving around, being tactical. But this has some interesting stuff that it does. And this really speaks to the mechanics of the game. I like the world and stuff, it's fine. I really like it, it's, it's fun. Uh, but the mechanics of Kill Team specifically is it does this thing where a lot of times in these miniature games, you will either like you do all your stuff, you move all your miniatures and your units and fire and do your combat and stuff like that. And then I will do all of my stuff. And it goes back and forth and you have big long turns. Or on the flip side, you have. I move a guy or I move a unit, do their thing, and then you move. And then I move another different unit that I haven't moved yet, and then you move and activate your other unit that haven't moved yet. This kind of melds those two things together, which really is awesome. And I kind of wish they would actually make uh, the Warhammer 40,000 proper game, the 8th edition, actually do this. I thought a little bit about it. I think it could work, but I'm not sure because it may not work. Because they're I, I still do like both those other style of games, but having them mash up together is awesome because what happens is I will move all of my guys if I'm first and have first initiative, and then you will move all your guys. And then we will take turns individually shooting back and forth. I shoot, you shoot, I shoot, you shoot. And then if there's anybody that happened to be through the movement phase in uh, close combat and they're in melee range, then I will fight with a guy, you will fight with a guy, I will fight with a guy, you will fight with a guy. And there's a couple other little rules there I'm leaving out. But that makes a very interesting game because with the whole I do everything, you do everything, that's much more strategic than I go activate, you activate, I activate, you activate, which is more tactical. So this kind of combines that thing. And because it's the movement, you have to be very strategic with your movement because you're like, okay, I'm gonna move this guy here. Well, 
that puts them a little bit in the open here, but they're the objectives over here. So I need to have a couple of guys here and this and that, but then maybe they're gonna get ambushed because I don't know what my opponent's gonna do with all of his movement and all that kind of stuff. And so you have that sort of long form strategy in the movement phase still, which is really like, honestly, the most interesting part of any of these miniature games is the movement. And it, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought that a couple of years ago when I started getting into these, but it's the movement is the game. And then you roll dice to see what happens <laughs> almost. Uh, so, but then you have the tactics of it. So I moved everything, you moved everything. It was like, well, okay, well maybe it's better I shoot with this guy first because he looks like he probably is gonna die. Uh, if these two guys, because he's got three guys lying aside of him, so I got to get a shot off with him before he dies. And then you go back, and then you go back and forth. And then so you can, there's still some decision making kind of broken through all of that combat. So anyway, the whole mashing of strategy versus tactics into the same system is awesome. Now the other sort of mechanical bit here, and you can use this next piece that I'm talking about in a narrative, in a one-off casual game, or in a competitive tournament environment, where all of the games that you're gonna play are gonna be a fixed number of points, usually 100, although with the Elite expansion, you're gonna see 125 point games, or you can do larger, not that much larger, but a little bit larger 200 point games with commanders. And it's not double the number of models when you do commanders because the commanders themselves are worth a ton of points. So it's like you have basically the same team, maybe an extra guy, maybe maybe less guys, and then you have your really just beefcake uh, commander that is just a total threat on the board. So you have a fixed target number of points that you're playing to, but then you're gonna bring more models than you can fit into that fixture of points. So maybe you bring like 20 models, but when you're playing 100 point games, maybe you can only use like seven or eight of them. So what that allows you to do is see, okay, so I'm gonna bring my whole force, my whole kill team, and then you will bring your whole kill team. And then we'll set up the board and pick a mission. And then I'm gonna say, what are you playing? Oh, you're playing Gene Stealer Cults. And you say, what am I playing? I'm playing Death Watch. Okay, so we'll go and then we'll pull 100 points of people out of our teams, sort of hidden, you know, we have, you can have like cards they're written on or just kind of pick them. And then you present them simultaneously and you say, oh, well, cause I'm playing Gene Stealer Cult, I'm gonna want some flamethrowers or I'm gonna want some frag cannons. Or if I was playing against a dark Eldar, uh, type of force, I would maybe want some better range or something or higher defense or something like that or better melee. So you can sort of tailor and whittle down your larger team, which is gonna be more well-rounded to theoretically fight the specific opponent that you're going against and they're doing the same thing to you. And you're also taking a look at the mission and stuff like that. So that's really cool because the one problem that a lot of these skirmish games have, especially if you do a campaign, is one player will start to get better and they're just gonna bring all their cool stuff every time. And then some other players are gonna get left behind because they're just gonna lose games. And so they're gonna be kind of behind the eight ball. So it's gonna kind of snowball and get away from you. Whereas this, if you level up a character because stuff can level up if you play in a campaign, then that when you bring that character, it actually becomes more expensive. So if I have Billy, the Death Watch Marine, and he's leveled up, his specialism was combat or something, and then I leveled up to level two and he took a cooler ability. Now instead of 16 points, he's 19 points. So now I gotta rethink, do I really wanna bring him? Because is he, that, is he worth it that much? Because he's, you know, it's, if he dies, then I spent all those points for nothing. So it's, it's, there's some give and take there. Uh, so all of that mechanical stuff is, is really why I like the game. Now, uh, I've not actually played this with more than two players, although it does play three and four. So I can't really speak to how a three and four player game plays with this. The play time is gonna be, mm, gosh, half an hour to maybe an hour, if you're learning the game. So I played this several times with some folks that were learning and the games were taking close to an hour. But once you get the game down, uh, it shouldn't take you more than an hour. But I have also played, I should say, you know, games with folks that have know the game and it just takes an hour because, you know, we're just kind of put it on cruise control. Uh, so yeah, so you're right in that ballpark. Although you can definitely have a game and go like 30 minutes because it's easy to, you know, maybe roll bad or something or just, you know, play poorly and get smoked or smoke somebody. Now in terms of other games that are in this vibe, there's a lot. There's a lot of games like there's Infinity, which is sort of a, uh, it's another futuristic kind of a skirmish game which gets a lot of praise. I've actually not played that, but everybody, every time I mention a skirmish game, somebody will say, you've got to play Infinity. <laughs> okay, so that's, I'm just gonna throw it out there because apparently that's the bee's knees. But on the flip side of it, 
There's another game from Games Workshop that I think a lot of folks will get into, and that's uh, Necromunda. And I honestly go back and forth in my head uh, which of these two games I like more, because Kill Team, all the stuff I just talked about with the mechanics and the, the way that the, the game flow breaks down over the course of a round, all that stuff, love it, just love it to death. Necromunda um, is almost like an RPG, but a tactical skirmish combat game that's it's just a heavily, heavy, heavy, heavy combat RPG. And I really like that, and I haven't had a chance, to, I've played Necromunda a few times, but I haven't had a chance to dig into the campaign aspect of it and, and really kind of go through that game. And I'm, I want to do that someday. I've got some friends that are interested in it. We just haven't really you know, got our stuff together and tried to, to run it through. And they've re-released the rule books a couple of times now. So it's like, now with the latest rendition of the rule books, like, oh, this is a, that's where it became clear. Like, this is an RPG. This is not just a skirmish game. This is a role-playing game. You need some kind of arbiter to sort of keep the, the campaign on the rails. You can't just really necessarily leave it up to players that are just gonna play it purely competitively, all this kind of stuff. So I would say definitely take a look at Necromunda. If, you, if you're if you not really like wanting to play, you know, competitive, mechanical, skilled, you know, you don't want to get into that crunchy side of the game, but you like the kind of crazy, dirty world of 40K and you, you know, you're more of a role player, you like some narrative in the games. Necromunda for sure is going to be, just have so much to chew on. And like I said, it's so much for me to chew on that I just don't really have time right now to get into it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so this is uh, number 19, Kill Team. Definitely take a look at it. It's pretty easy to get into. You can get boards and stuff without any terrain and just play kind of like a board game style thing. And then they have nice little uh, boxes of terrain for like 80 bucks and they'll come with a board and some terrain and you can get up and running. And they're really easy to put together and they're color coded so you don't really have to paint the terrain or anything if you don't want to, that kind of stuff. So it's easy to kind of gradually get into and a kill team box of miniatures will cost you anywhere from like I don't know, 30 to 50 to 60 bucks worth of stuff. Uh, and you can definitely go in and get more and, and you know make it more, but you don't have to get into all that right away. So it's very quick and easy to pick up and get into, which is another plus for it, frankly. All right, so that's number uh, 19, Kill Team. Now, keeping on a similar vibe, uh, number 18 is Gaslands, and this is a book. This is the first book that I'm uh, re uh, putting on the list. So this is a miniature game. And this is to be played with Hot Wheels. And this is set in kind of a futuristic, sort of a cross between uh, the old Running Man movie from the 80s, if you're familiar with that, and Mad Max. So it's like car combat, death race, you know, stuff like that with templates. And it just tells you, go get Hot Wheels and mash them up and find little guns and stuff from your 40k models or whatever go to amazon and get a pack of like little plastic guns for 20 bucks and glue them onto your car and paint the cars up and smash them and make them dirty and all that kind of stuff make it look like they're in the post apocalypse and then you can just play all these different kinds of scenarios where you're running around shooting each other uh you know just doing races or there's a whole different set of scenarios uh, the thing that I like about this game, first of all, is you get to just take Hot Wheels, go get a bunch of them for a couple of bucks off Craigslist or whatever, eBay, and don't, you don't have to touch the Hot Wheel at all. You can just say, this looks funky, I'm gonna use this, and I'm gonna tell my friend that has a machine gun on the top of it, and you go, okay, because you don't usually field more than two or three cars per side, so it's easy to remember what does what and that kind of stuff. And then you just you know lay down some templates. The templates you can print out in the back of the book. You can go to several websites and get acrylic templates and stuff like that. There's some specialized dice, but uh, you could go pick those up. Or you can just use D6s. There's an easy translation for you know what one through six means in terms of the dice. Uh, now, the important part of this, again, talking about the game mechanically, is actually the dice. So when you move the car, let's say you're racing around or you're trying to get an angle to shoot somebody because you know some weapons will be on a turret or some of them you have to shoot straight ahead or off to the side, you'll sort of specify as you make up your list you know, what direction the weapons point and stuff like that. So as you're driving around, you're gonna pick a template and based on kind of what gear phase you're in, you're going to, as soon as you touch a template, you've gotta choose that. There's no like pre-measuring. So, because you don't really pre-measure when you drive, right? So this is very much about the driving as much as it is about the combat. So you pick the template and you and you go for it. And then, you, depending on what you want to do, 
you're gonna roll some dice to possibly try to trigger some effects or shift up and down. So the game really forces you to, to roll these dice. And as you roll these dice, you can then get uh, extra shifts and things to go up and down gears and to sort of cancel out some of the negative effects of the dice. And those, so what's happening is you're gonna generate hazards on your turn. And you, it's a lot of kind of push your luck mitigation of, of things that can, that can happen. So as you're driving, you might spin out, you might do a slide, you might want to do a slide because maybe you're going around a sharp, sharp corner. So you're like, well, I wanna push my luck with these dice. So I wanna do a spin and go onto the slide and then I can go straight down the other way. So it feels very visceral and tactical in seat of your pants and it feels very much like driving. And that's why I, in, <laughs> they don't call this channel drive through review for nothing. So because I can get into that visceral, like and my knuckles are white and I'm driving through all of these suckers and trying to you know win the race or whatever, shoot them and all that. Uh, and the way that you crash and things is just really neat. And so really this is, this is like such a perfect uh, meld of a game to me because you've got that just easy to get into, pick up a couple of Hot Wheels and you're in, and then you can just, I mean, who cares? If you, you don't paint miniatures and stuff, it's a Hot Wheel. You, you paid a buck for it, hopefully, or less. And you can just get some paint, smash it on there, get some decals and like, you know, screen them on there and get a stupid little gun and paint it metallic silver and put it on there and make it messy and throw dirt on it and glue the dirt on it and do whatever you want to do. And you made a thing and you can just practice with it. And there's a ton of just ideas out there that, uh, you know, people, you can go to the Gaslands Facebook page and there's a couple of Gaslands Facebook pages where you can just scroll through the images and they're like, that's cool, that looks neat, I'm gonna do something like that. So the hobby side of it is just deadly easy to get into. And then you have the whole mechanical side of it and just the, the ease at which you can pick up and play the game. Like you don't have to go and do all the hobby stuff. You can just grab some Hot Wheels and go and you're playing and racing. Uh, the first scenario in the book is just a race. And so you kind of race to these different checkpoints and there's no shooting, there's no combat. And so you hit the first checkpoint and then it's a free for all and everybody dies. <laughs> but you can just play without that. So like if you're playing with kids and stuff, and you want to kind of slowly introduce it, you can just play, let's just, we're gonna play a race. There's no guns, nobody's getting shot. And then you can just race around and go from like, you know, just make your own little track. It's like, we're gonna race here, go down to this point and up to here, and then that's it. So you can make it pretty simple and easy to get into. And that's even a fine uh, learning game as well. I would say even if you're an experienced gamer and you're like, you never played Gaslands before, just pick it up and race race a little bit. And then you kind of get the hang of the dice and, and how to sort of control and when to push your lock and all that stuff. Cause that is a huge giant chunk of the game. That is the game really. Um, so this is just that perfect, the books, like I think you can get this on Amazon sometimes for 12 or 15 bucks. Uh, it's got everything you need in it. The community's great. And I don't know, it's just, I can't, like this is a game like everybody should just get. Cause you can just get it for a few bucks, you know, uh, photocopy the templates and print them on some like cardstock or something and grab some dice and away you go. And it's just a, it's a piece of cake. And it's just a whole ton of ridiculous fun. Now I've never played this with more than two players, although I would play this with uh, more than two players, uh, but you could play this really any number of players that you want. If you've got a bunch of like 40K tanks and bikes and buggies from the orcs and stuff like that, there's this, you can get a scaled template set for that, that larger scale. So if you, you know, if you got a bunch of 40K friends, you could get, get these and just jump into it and play it like that. And that would be really cool too. Um, and I think it would be a lot of fun, act frankly, with, with uh, more than two players, but I, I've not played it with more than two. Uh, your games are gonna take, well, I mean, if you had like eight players playing in a race and everybody had one car, I could see that taking like an hour and a half at least. Um, but you know, a two player game would take you an hour probably. Um, and then as far as, you know, what games is this like? This really kind of like just axed out any kind of flying naval type of game. And this is what I'll tell you, you won't see anything like X-Wing or Armada or Sails to Glory or any of those kind of naval games. I hate, like I've, I've come to realize, even X, like I loved X-Wing when I first played it, but now that I've played like more miniature games, I just can't handle steering boats <laughs> and templated movement and all this stuff. So this really breaks a lot of rules for me. And the reason it does 
is because of that whole driving aspect. Like I said, I love the driving, you know, thrill part of it. And also terrain. So you can set up, uh, you know, terrain and stuff. So when I play a miniature game personally, uh, you know, we'll talk more about this later and even a little bit in regards to the kill team, but I like to have a decent amount of terrain on the board. And not necessarily just for the looks, which is, it's cool too, but I like, if I'm gonna play a miniature game, I want that, the miniature's body and their physical space and their line of sight, all that stuff to be important. I don't necessarily want that to, well, I want it to exist, first of all. It can be abstracted a little bit. You know, you can get really granular and sucky with it, but I want the, the terrain to matter. I want space to matter. I want to run out of room. I want to be able to get trapped or trap other people or ambush them and, you know, make the terrain matter. And so this game, Gaslands, it breaks all the rules for me because a lot of times when you're you know sailing your ship around and just floating through the sea or space it's like oh i'm just like what puts me to sleep and yeah you can have terrain in that but it's a lot of times it's just not super that important and i like to see the physical terrain on the table the mountainside of the giant rock or the giant you know pile of gas cans or whatever and have to you know deal with maneuvering around that uh, so that's why this breaks that rule but x-wing though i still have a good place in my heart you can have asteroids and stuff i guess but um x-wing i would also recommend because i did have a lot of fun with that for about a year or so so uh, number 18 gas lands and we're going to go to number 17 a little bit bigger of a box and we really have quite the theme here don't worry this list today will not just be all miniature games this is claustrophobia 1643 uh, this is a re-implementation of claustrophobia which came out about 10 years ago i just reviewed this game a few months ago uh, the original claustrophobia was on my top 100 i think it was in the top 22 and uh, this is definitely a marketed improvement uh, on the game it's very much like a euro style miniature game so each there's a two-player game only and each player has like a little dice game they're playing you have four sort of heroes or ex-convicts that are sent down to these dungeons to try to fight back the demon hordes and there's a little like dice worker placement thing where you roll some dice and put it on there and then the demon player has like a little kingsburg board where they roll some dice and they have different action selection spaces and they're trying to set up dice combos and stuff like that to generate threats which they can spend to uh, summon monsters or they might spend dice to uh, you know get those monster special abilities or break some of the rules in the game and there's some cards and things that'll like mitigate the dice rolls or give you cool special effects that will you know sort of sit on top of the other abilities and stuff in the game but this game the claustrophobia does something that i really enjoy which is it's not a campaign uh you know it's not like a descent or imperial assault or whatever it's just let's pick a scenario it's going to be sort of uh skewed towards one side or the other it might be a little easier for the villain it might be a little easier for the heroes but it's going to be a puzzle that they kind of both have to solve both players and then you're playing like this you know little action dice mechanic Euro game with some rolls to resolve combat, just some D6 rolls. Uh, and it sets up a really fun, quick to play puzzle. And it's just one of the easiest miniature games to just slip right into. And once you get a hang of the rules and everything, which are not super uh, hard, although the rule book in this particular edition tries to make it a little bit harder. The rule book is like a little bit, eh, what? I thought I knew how to play this game. But once you get how to know how to play it, it's not too bad. Uh, but there's also like a lot of little uh, icons and things like that for special abilities and like different scenarios will grant your heroes and stuff different special abilities. So have these like a little bit of iconography thing kind of get in the way. But once you kind of get through that, which is just take you a couple of plays, uh, then it's just so easy to just slip right into it play a couple of games in a row games are going to take you about oh i don't know probably half an hour to 45 minutes for each game and then you know you can just play it a couple of times you can just take turns you can say oh well, let's play that scenario and it's just very easy to swap and you know i'll play demon player now and you play the heroes and then we'll go at it and because each of the scenarios has that like puzzle quality and like i said the the basic core rules is super dead simple once you get over a little bit of barrier rule book um you know you're just in and it's just it, it feels like you're just picking up a familiar board game and i kind of forget that i'm playing 
uh, you know, like a mere trashy skirmish miniature game sometimes. It's like, oh, well, so I was playing a dice, dice worker placement there game for there for a second, and now we're fighting, you know? So it just sits really in a unique, special spot to me. And the new edition just really ups the, uh, ups the ampy, amp, ups the amps on the the component quality and the miniatures and the cards and the, all the tiles and things look really cool now but this is the game that i always kind of go back to and i say like if you're a euro gamer at heart and but sometimes you want to like punch demons in the face this is a good one to try <laughs> so that's kind of where this fits for me and this you know before i really even got into miniature games like i did over the last couple of years you know, I loved claustrophobia several years ago, seven, eight years ago when I first played it. And I was like, this is cool. I wish there were more, you know, Ameritrash games that were like this, that used funky mechanics. Because back in the, the day, you would just say, well, I'm going to roll 40 D6s. And so, so they, you know, they said, well, let's try, let's try to, you know, reevaluate the whole um, approach to this style of game. Anyway, so that's uh, 1643. So uh, two-player only game. It, like I said, it takes about a half hour, maybe 45 minutes in a scenario. kind of depends. Some of the scenarios are sort of designed to be shorter or faster um, than others. And then as far as other games like it, and the other game that I'll mention here is uh, came out two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. It's called Warhammer Underworlds. And it's, uh, it's hard to explain. Warhammer Underworlds would definitely be on my top 100 games of all time. And it's, uh, you probably heard of it. it was, it's been a pretty decent hit the last couple of years. Set in the Age of Sigmar universe, uh, players have a fixed warband of, of characters, and then they have these decks that they can deck build, like in Magic the Gathering. You build your deck beforehand, and you play, and then you just play like best out of three games. And the, the cool thing about that game is, it's a lot like playing Magic, so if you've played Magic, you probably slip right into that one. But you also build two decks in that game. You build your action deck, and all the different skills and abilities that you can do, but then you also build your points deck. So you draw the scoring card, so you can try to score different ways in different games. So I can take the same warband with the same kind of deck of special abilities, and then I'm gonna take this other way of scoring points. So I might try to score objectives, or I might try to uh, score points by you know killing certain things and stuff. I'm having a brain fart. But there's a lot of different ways to score points, and you can focus and build your scoring deck in a certain way, and that's that's just going to change up how you're going to play. And it's all on a board. There's no you know terrain or anything. It's just a skirmish hex and move board. So it kind of feels a little bit like HeroScape. Or if you ever played that Planeswalker Magic: The Gathering game, where it was like uh, HeroScape, but it was Magic: The Gathering, you know, and it was on a board. This is like that almost, but it's just a much more you know fleshed out game. So anyway, so that's uh, number seventeen, uh, Class of Probably sixteen forty three, with also. If this doesn't sound interesting, or you know, you missed it on Kickstarter, because this is a Kickstarter only game, then go check out Warhammer Underworlds. And then I think this is yes, this is the last uh, miniature game on the list today. Number sixteen is Rumble Slam, and this is from TT Combat or Tabletop Combat, which is a UK company. And I think still right now you can only get this from them from their website, although. You might be able to find this at somewhere like Miniature Market. They were supposed to bring it over. Oh, and this, as you can see, is basically fantasy uh, wrestling. So if you think like WWE or WWF uh, wrestling, but with fantasy uh, characters. Uh, so each player, it's a two-player game, will take a team of wrestlers. They're all in the ring at the same time. And you'll uh, take turns kind of activating them and then running them into each other and kind of playing... Uh, like a Royal Rumble, but as teams. Um, and so you're just trying to throw the other, um, you know, opponents, uh, players, uh, characters out of the ring, and then last one standing wins. And you build up your points, and there's different factions and stuff like that. And you can just go pick up a box of the faction for like 30 bucks. And they're these, I'm gonna say they're resin miniatures, but they're really nice. They're not crappy resin miniatures. Because sometimes when you say their miniatures are made out of resin, it's, it's a lot of people go, oh, really? These are very, very nice, because I, I kind of do that sometimes too. But the, the resin miniatures here are very nice. The miniatures are easy. Uh, most of them are already assembled. There's no assembly, but sometimes you have to like glue on a big old arm or something. So there's some assembly, but like almost nothing. And then of course you can paint them and things like that. Uh, but the gameplay here is really cool. This is definitely my favorite like sports board game. 
uh, you know, I played Blood Bowl and uh, Blitz Bowl and Dread Bowl and some other games I'm forgetting. And this one to me is just the most fun. It has the most crunchy thematic little mechanics that you can do. You can activate special abilities and combo stuff and throw guys into the ropes and then clothesline them as they come by or climb up the turnbuckle and jump off and pick guys up and you know do all these different tests and things. And each of the characters has their own little card which has their different stats and their abilities. And you're gonna roll different, different custom dice based on you know what, what they're capable of. And then in addition to some of like, there's like six, maybe six or eight sort of basic faction teams that you can pick from. And then some of them are sort of uh, aligned, you know, like it's not really good versus evil, but they're sort of sponsored by different management. So you can kind of combine them, but there's some that you can't because they're kind of cross management. And then there's also like these mercenary type of figures and they just come in single packs. And I think those are like 15 bucks, maybe 20 bucks for some of them, but they're, you know, they're specialized individual ones. So if you want to buy those, you can, uh, but those are some, a lot of times sort of tailored to look like other pop culture figures. Like there's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle looking one, but it's not a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, but it looks just like one. And then uh, I was, I was showing pictures that you saw like an orc who looks pretty much like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> so he's like tearing his shirt and stuff. And then I've got another little like dwarf who looks like a cowboy dwarf, uh, Randy Macho Man Savage. So they have some of that. There's like one that looks like The Undertaker, which I don't have. There's a bunch of other things like that. There's one that looks like a, I think it's like a giant pig. And it looks like that, uh, remember that cop from the 80s? It was like Boss Man or something. He, he always used to beat up Hulk Hogan or something when I was like eight. But, so they've got like, you know, some of your favorite wrestlers from the history, but then sort of mutated into a fantasy and then without, you know, infringing copyright, they're not named or like the real wrestler names or other things from pop culture. So you can splash those in as well into some of these teams. And I found that the best way to play, I've got a few teams and some of those uh, mercenaries, the best way to play, I think, is just a straight out team out of the box and then maybe one of those mercenaries to kind of have your little special guy running around that's sort of causing havoc. Um, and like I said, the teams are like 30 bucks a piece. And if you feel like picking up one of the mercenaries are like 15 bucks usually, sometimes they're a little bit more. Uh, and the game itself is a pretty affordable, I think it was 50 or 60 bucks. Uh, and the, the cool ring and stuff that you have on it is this felt mat. And it just, it's, this is one of those, it's just, this is so fun to play. Uh, you know, cause I was a kid, like a, uh, preteen, junior high, you know, I used to watch wrestling and stuff and Hogan was big and all that kind of stuff. And it was just super silly. And, and this is just, it's so full of character and life. And this is one of those games where mechanics are great. They're solid, they're fun. You know, you've got different colored dice and all that. And it, it just, there's nothing, there's nothing super wrong about the mechanics, but the, the world and, and the character and the live, the, it's like lively uh, activity on the game just elevates it to that next level and it's just perfect for that silly WWE wrestling vibe and you can just feel like you're getting into uh, a little bit of the trash talk and all that stuff and there's like little uh, crowd abilities that you can trigger with some dice rolls that make the guy really good or if you like if you like do something too much then the crowd gets bored and they start booing so that actually helps or hurts you and stuff like this there's a lot of weird cool little things like that uh, in the game and it is pretty quick and easy to pick up and play and um, you know, and get into. Um, so I definitely uh, recommend Rumble Slam. It's 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 not hard to come by. You just got to order it from their website. They do ship from the UK. So if you are in the states, you know, it's a little bit of shipping. Um, but if you go to Gen Con stuff, I know I've seen them there. Then you can pick it up there. And, or you can pick up some teams and stuff there, and that's where I picked up some extra teams. Um, so definitely, if you go to a convention like that and they show up, I would take a look at the game, get a demo of it. Because it's, I mean, it's really flown under the radar because it's not really, like in distribution, it's readily available. You just gotta go find it and seek it out. Um, so that's Rumble Slam, really enjoy it. Two player only, I think. I don't think you can play with more than three, maybe you can. And then, actually I think you can, I'm remembering the rule book now. So I think you can play with more than two. I never played with more than two. Games take about an hour, maybe. And then as far as other games that it's like, uh, there's one other sports game that I've really enjoyed, and that is Guild Ball from uh, something Forge. I can't remember the name, the Forge Master or something. They've done a few different games, but they have a game called Guild Ball, which is basically like fantasy soccer. 
Um, that game is awesome. Now it's kind of funkily supported and stuff, and they have they're supposed to switch to plastic miniatures, but all I see is metal miniatures. There's some plastic, some metal. I hate metal miniatures. So, um, but if you like Guild Ball, there is a nice starter box for Guild Ball that's all plastic and they're color coded, so you don't have to paint it. You don't have to assemble those miniatures. Uh, they're in there. They're single mold plastic. Uh, I would pick that up. That's a really cool game. It, it, when I was talking about Claustrophobia 1643 with the kind of the Euro style mechanics in a miniatures game, Guild Ball does that. It takes a, kind of borrows a lot of mechanics from War Machine, uh, which has come out a few years ago, several years ago, and they've had multiple editions. This kind of takes that similar action point mechanic and adds on a lot of cool fun stuff. I like Guild Ball way more than War Machine. Um, so if you like War Machine, then Guild Ball I think is a no brainer. And uh, and I, anyway, I highly recommend Guild Ball as well. That would be one. Honestly, like I really hate metal miniatures. I know it's a problem and it's not really fair, but I just hate them. Okay. <laughs> if it wasn't for the number of the metal miniatures in Guild Ball, it'd be in my top 100. As it stands, <laughs> it would not be because I can't stand metal miniatures. Um, so that's uh, Rumble Slam there. That will bring us to number 15 which is the Game of Thrones board game. Uh, this is the second edition. There was a first edition. I don't think you can find first edition anymore. Uh, this one, I say that you, you need the Mother of Dragons expansion to, to have this, uh, you know, to, you need it. I think it's a must have because it f basically fixes the game. I still really liked it. I was in my top 100 or something a couple of years ago, uh, but the Mother of Dragons expansion just makes it way better. So obviously, this is the Game of Thrones, the board game, so yeah. So if you know about Game of Thrones, you probably have some idea how it works. You're playing one of the different houses, you know, Lannister, Stark, uh, Targaryen with the expansion, uh, Greyjoys, Baratheon, all that stuff. And then it's kind of a territory control game with armies and you're trying to control different resource points and control different fortresses and strongholds and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, it has a really cool kind of um, diplomacy-esque uh, style order system where you put order tokens out. Everybody puts their order tokens out at the same time and then you reveal them all. And then you activate them in kind of a, depending on the order, but also in initiative order of the players they'll activate. And so you'll move armies around and attack and um, you know generate uh, resources and income and all that kind of stuff. And it has this like generic uh, power token, which is just basically money. Uh, but it's more, more abstract than money even. And you'll use that to do a lot of different things. Just sort of bid to have control of the Iron Throne or maybe, you know, have like the, uh, the, the, the uh, what is the guy, the Whisperer guy with the Hand of the King and the, the Leader of Whispers. I'm having a brain fart. And, you know, the Master of Coin, Master of Whispers, that kind of stuff, <laughs> sorry. And then, uh, so you kind of control those things, also give you special abilities, you have to deal with the wildlings coming in. If you have the Mother of Dragons expansion, you have to deal with Daenerys coming in, and uh, all this stuff. It's an amazing game. Uh, the, the reason I mentioned the expansion is because it kind of fixes a lot of the issues you can have with different player counts. You can even fix the issue with having players uh, drop out of the game uh, because there's sort of a, what's called like a vassal system. And you will always have a certain number of the factions in play. Players won't necessarily be controlling all of them. So if you have three players, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but you may have three other vassal factions that players are bidding to sort of take control and use their armies to kind of do their bidding. And they just kind of act as brainless factions controlled by that player, sort of extend your forces. That's really cool. Um, and so if a player were to drop out of a game, let's say you were playing uh, like a seven player game and then you know Billy had to go, that's fine. They just become a force that is able to be controlled and be bid on and, 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 and controlled by a player to kind of do their bidding. So that's kind of a neat thing. Maybe their leader was assassinated and now there's still an army around that you control. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, it's got a lot of other interesting things, a very uh, Kemet-like combat. Uh, if you've ever played Kemet where you have your forces and it's very deterministic, but then you have uh, the ability to sort of uh, contribute your forces and ally and support um, you know your friends if you want or if you don't want you can kind of back out of the last minute and leave them hanging and then you have these cards that you can play to activate special characters that are kind of have special abilities and beef up your combat but once you play the card you can't play it until you do something to pick them back up or you play through all your cards 
so that's kind of a nice Kemet idea there. I really enjoy this game. It has a lot of screwage and trash talk, and it's really, like I mentioned before, kind of a diplomacy with like a lot of extra mechanics on top of it. And it's got the whole Game of Thrones thing. And I love Game of Thrones. I even love season eight. Uh, so, you know, deal with it. <laughs> like, I love that season. I love the books, and I've read all the books and the extra books and the extra short stories and every stupid. I read the World of Ice and Fire giant book. I, I really enjoy the whole Westeros, Essos uh, game, Game of Thrones stuff. I'm really into that thing. Uh, you know, it's one of my favorite, like, fantasy worlds. It's just funky and dark and post-apocalyptic and everything. Magic is all gone from the world, and there's still a tiny bit left, but it really sucks, and it doesn't work right. <laughs> and, like, you can't really count on it to do anything. You can sacrifice people to the Lord of Light, and it does absolutely nothing for your dumb army because you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, I love stuff. I was like, I love it. That's just great. So I can really get into the theme of uh of the game obviously and a lot of my friends have been really into the show and and the books and stuff and so a lot of it i gotta say is it has to do with the ip but the game is very very solid uh and it really lends itself to just backstabbing each other talking trash you know invoking uh some of the characters uh out of the books in the show and all that kind of stuff role playing it up a little bit and uh it doesn't take too long to play now i haven't played it with the full seven Let's see. Let's talk about player count. Now, the player count, I would say, I'm just going to throw out, without the expansion, forget it. I'm just going to say, don't get it. But I'm going to say, if you get the Mother of Dragons expansion, I would recommend the other expansions only if you get the Mother of Dragons expansion. The Feast for Crow expansions, I would burn that to the Lord of Light. I do not like that expansion. However, there's some fixes in the Mother of Dragons expansion, I think, that would fix that. And then there's also the Dances with Dragons expansion. Another dragon expansion. That one I actually liked anyway. Uh, but you can definitely combine that one with the mother dragons. So sorry to digress. Um, but player count with the mother of dragons expansion. I don't think it matters. Now I've not played every single player count. But I, and I want to play it with seven. Although to find six other people to play the game with me. That is going to take some time. It would take, I could see it. Here's the thing. So I've played this game and it's taken like four plus hours. I've also played it with, I don't remember if it was five or six, but we got it done in about three hours. It was, it was a lot of players. This is before the expansion. Um, so once players know the game, it is pretty snappy, especially the first few rounds. There's not like, there's stuff going on. There's not a lot going on. Whereas you move into the later rounds, there's a lot of like, don't you, you know, I don't want to swear in this video, but don't you, you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of back and forth. And so that, that is what will actually drag the game time down. It's not really the mechanics. So if you just went and kind of stodgily played, you know, and put your uh, little tokens out and didn't move, are you going to support me? No, you know, do that. So if you just played it like that, the game is going to be quicker. But if you go to like, uh, like, let's go in the other room. We're going in the other room. You know, we're going to talk about this. No, Billy, you can't come. You know, that if you had that kind of stuff, you could take like a whole day and just eat it up. And so I would play with seven, although I think that would, you'd be pushing like the six, the five hour, you know, six hour mark. Um, so yeah, so I will recommend any player count as long as you have the Mother of Dragons expansion. And then as far as play time, just, you know, give yourself room depending on how, how grumbly your group gets. Uh, now the other game that I would mention here, it, it's on my top 100, and I'm kind of waiting for the new edition to come out here in the next year or so, and that's Dune the board game. I only had a chance to play that a few times, and I haven't played it in a while. Uh, really enjoyed that game. I'm very curious to see, though, how the new edition uh, comes out. Now it's similar to this. You've got some asymmetric uh, houses, you know, House Atreides and Harkonnen and stuff. That's an even funkier game design, and you can actually have like shared victories and stuff. Definitely look at that new edition of Dune when it comes out. I'm hoping to get it somehow and get some more plays of the new one to see are there any rules tweaks, you know, what did they do to it. Um, but yeah, so this, and it's, and it's set again in another very kind of weird and funky dark science fiction IP uh, that I really uh, jive with too. Um, you know, just a random tangent. I would have said before Game of Thrones, like Dune was my favorite kind of weird science fiction fantasy uh, IP because it just, 
I don't know. It's 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 like it's hard to explain why I enjoy those. But they're kind of like they're sort of spiteful. <laughs> the, the, the Dune reality and the Game of Thrones reality they're very they're very spiteful to our reality in a lot of ways, and I just I just love that. And um, so yeah, so I would have said you know Dune is Dune Dune would be my favorite science fiction, and Game of Thrones would be my favorite kind of fantasy thing versus like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or whatever. Um, but I think Game of Thrones is more more my favorite too. So that might be playing into why this is way up above Dune. Anyway, but definitely if you really like some funky negotiation, big grasp graspy games, uh, definitely take a look at Game of Thrones and the new Dune when it comes out. So that'll bring us to number 14. Oh, it's right in front of me. And that is going to be Urban Sprawl. This game came out a few years ago from GMT Games. And I had another game from, I believe it was in the last video, from the same designer, Chad Jensen, uh, Combat Commander Europe. This is nothing like that. <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is my favorite, easily, we'll put that right there like that, my favorite city building game. And it is the most funky, least friendly, and not only the players being least friendly, but the game is the least friendly to you in terms of city building game. I really like the concept of Sim City and building cities and stuff. And like similar to I like, you know, Game of Thrones as a theme or 40K as a theme or Civilization games, for example, as a theme or some other things you might see in the next video. I like city building. That's a really attractive theme to me. And to me, Urban Sprawl is the one for me that does it the absolute uh, best. Because it's not one of these where it's like, you have your little city and I have my little city and I'm building my little board and it has nothing to do with your city except maybe you took a tile I wanted or whatever. That stuff's okay, but I like this because this again gets into, uh, it, it, like it's a little cynical, right? And I think that's why I like talking about Game of Thrones. Urban Sprawl looks at things, I think not just cynically, but realistically is, Players are sort of uh, living through this town that's going to grow into a city, which is going to grow to a metropolis, and they're really going to try to carve out their own piece of the pie and, and you know get the most points and money and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you have to play on a shared board. It's kind of a Tetris-y looking board with you know lots of different colored buildings for the different types of buildings in the game, or commerce and industrial and residential and all that kind of thing and you're putting stuff out there, you're taking control of it, you're trying to position and almost like naturally create certain neighborhoods that are gonna just come up and get scored at different times. The game's gonna throw a lot of like random events and things like at you, which is one of the things I really like about the SimCity game is when you're playing it and you're like, oh crap, there is a giant earthquake in half my cities, you know? You know, that's the kind of stuff I'm like, I like that. You know, I, why would I just wanna sit there and be like, Oh, I've optimized my little engine that I built and then look at it go like, oh my gosh, that's going to put me to sleep. So you want the thing to kind of hit you over the head, which is what, you know, people in government, frankly, and especially city government and even the federal government has to put up with it. Like, hey, we're, we're working. The economy's doing good. Oh, there's a hurricane, you know, or there's a terrorist attack or there's a cyber threat or something like you've got to pivot and deal with it. And you've got to sort of. Uh, hopefully deal with it for the right reasons and all that stuff and not try to carve out your own special victory out of it. Um, but you do in this game. <laughs> so, um, so, cause as you sort of position yourself, you'll start to just kind of automatically get elected to different offices. And I think it's abstracted in this case where you're sort of controlling who the mayor and the sheriff and so on is, and then kind of reaping the benefit. And then you're, it's almost like these different political wings and these little factions and unions and things like that that are at play in the city politic and and uh, because you're controlling the neighborhoods that's sort of extrapolating to that. Now this is all done, I've not talked about any mechanics, which shows you why I think it's such a good game because I'm just talking about the concepts. Um, but the mechanics are just card drafting and uh, think of like through the ages and, and building up a little bit of a, not a tableau, but like a little bit of a reserve of those and then <laughs> waiting for the catastrophe to hit and setting yourself up in a position so that you don't get beat up by it. Because as you sort of cycle through the different building permits and the different types of buildings that can come out, that's what that's gonna trigger the events of the game. 
And so you can have that kind of uh, spiral on you if you're not, because if you just go into this, this is the other thing I like about it. You know, I kind of mentioned with those other city builders, like, oh, I'm building this thing and I'm doing this. This is my little path to victory that I decided to do. I'm doing this path to victory today. And then, sorry to be snarky, but the game is snarky. And this one is like, I better friggin' dial this in and not just like spread myself all over the city. I need to get going on this and I know I'm gonna take my lumps in this sector of the city because I'm not got the right type of uh, uh, building types here or don't control any of this. And so you've got to really sort of set up your little strongholds of power within the sort of the different neighborhoods and the different types of industries in the city and then kind of weather all those storms and play through them and, and, and try to balance like the victory point generation versus the money generation. There's a very big tug and pull uh, between that, especially early on in the game. And there's definitely a switch like that. And then it's also very thematic because you can actually physically see the city grow and the, and the city decks will change themselves out as you like, you get an airport. And I think the last thing is you get an Olympic, the Olympics come to your city and stuff like that. And that triggers the end game and it'll score different um, elections and, you know, different payouts and all that stuff as you move, move your way up to kind of growing this town into a large metropolis. It's just a fantastic game. Now, uh, the player count, I would say, Hmm. Two and three, for sure, is my favorite player count. I kind of go back and forth because I really like the two-player game. It's a little bit more on the rails and controllable, and you can kind of, it's just much easier to digest and sort of uh, keep gauge of what the other player's doing. Three's still pretty good, and then with four, like, you know, <laughs> like it gets a little bit crazy because stuff can just change so much after, you, like, you take your turn and then three other players go. So, so much can change that it's a little bit harder to keep that, uh, you know, that Mustang uh, in its saddle, so to speak. Um, but definitely a good two and three player game. Uh, and I would play it four, but with the right people. But if we got four players that like, are like, oh, I love Urban Sprawl. Yeah, let's just play and get funky. And then four players, okay, if that is settled, then I'm in. If there's somebody that's like, I don't know, then I don't wanna play with four. But I can bet you I could play with somebody that was like a little bit weird on it and like it with two players because then we can kind of get into the same space. Uh, but yeah, so the game is going to take, ooh, what does the box say? Yeah, it says three hours. It takes about three hours. Even with two players, it's gonna take a good chunk of time. You're gonna be at the two and a half to three hour mark. And I'd say with four, yeah, I don't know, you're gonna go more than three hours, I think, <laughs> unless everybody's played it with, you know, a lot. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, two, three players, this, that's what I would lock it in at, and you're gonna take three, maybe four hours tops uh, with the lower player count. And then in terms of other games like this, what did I put down? Oh, that's right, nothing. I basically, I put like nothing with a question mark on my notes because like I kind of said, there's a lot of other, like they're, they're fine city building games, but for me, I don't want to utter them in the same breadth as this game, because this game just really is a completely different animal uh, than a lot of those other kind of city building games that have come out over the last several years. Um, so I'm gonna say nothing, because there's really nothing like this that you can say, well, Joel, that sounds kind of interesting, but I don't know about this part of the, what you explained. Uh, I don't know. I couldn't really tell you another game, because this is such a weird, different, funky game with the whole car drafting and the way that you can kind of get hit over the head with the random events. They're not random, but they kind of, they come up in the same way every game, just in different orders. Um, yeah, so, so other city building games, go take a look at them, but they're nothing uh, like this. So number 13 is here. I'll get this one up here. This is The Gallerist. Um, this is came out a couple years ago. This is from Vital Asserta, who's done a few other games that I've really liked, uh, like Venus and CO2 is one I've really liked. This one is about running an art gallery. And uh, well, not just a gallery, but it's kind of just about the art world itself. And it's got, there's a lot going on in this game, uh, mechanically. It's like, if you're familiar with Vital Asserta games, they're big, huge, crunchy uh, Euros. Uh, they are just a lot's going on. Once you kind of get into his games though, they are, I would say, relatively easy to pick up. There's, there's usually a lot of different stuff going on. You gotta kind of juggle a lot of things. But I do personally find them pretty intuitive once you sit down and start playing. Um, you won't be lost the whole game once you get in. Now this is an interesting thing because it's 
it's like a worker placement game so you can go and take these different uh, actions for action spaces and you can go and sort of invest in upcoming artists uh, buy and sell artists um, deal with different types of patrons that are coming to your your galleries because some of them will be interested in sort of the marketability of the art versus uh, you know they're like collecting the art and you know some are more like critics kind of thing and then there's also like the sort of I call it like the overseas market the the international market of stuff so you try to sell and you know build up sort of sets and collections of certain styles so uh, it, it's it's almost it's nice because it's like a it does a good job of abstracting like nebulous market stuff and like supply and demand it really kind of tools around with that but it fits in a, in, a, in a very interesting way with sort of all of the different, like I mentioned the different patrons, there's like these different tickets too that you can use to boost things up. So it really makes kind of tangible um, a lot of the things that are important in marketing and stuff like, I could see this kind of thing like applied to like a pop culture thing or something like that, or, or more modern business, you know, like the iPhone. Because not only is the iPhone like do a thing and it's a widget and it it's fulfills a, a function, but there's also like a little bit of style and stuff like that with it. And so the, because this is about fine art, it's it, it really leans into a lot of that kind of stuff where it's you're playing around with the different, because people appreciate art for different reasons, right? So it kind of leans into that. So the, the marketability, is this artist hot or not? Or, you know, does a collector want this style of thing in their home and, or whatever and this kind of stuff so it plays around with all of that kind of stuff and does a really good job of juggling all of that um, and then the mechanic like I said it's four worker placement spots and then you go to a spot if somebody else wants to go there you're not blocking them like in a lot of other worker placement games somebody will go there and they'll kick you out and then you can kind of do a bonus action which is like the only thematic break in the game but it's such a cool mechanical hook that it doesn't it doesn't bother me because it's such a neat thing. Because like I went here because I know you need to go there. <laughs> and I know I'm gonna get this little bonus. Nobody's going over here because I've I've thought myself outside of your box and you're just kicking me around the whole game. I'm just getting booted all over the place. And uh and so trying to sort of set yourself up in that kind of way to be reacted against uh is just really cool. I like that kind of idea. Um, I don't really know thematically what that's supposed to tie into, but the rest of the game is very thematic. There's certain things that you're uh, tracking and little bonus things on your player board and all that kind of stuff that I don't want to get too heavy into. Uh, but this to me is, this is my favorite Lacerda game. Um, you know, I like CO2, I like Vinos. Mm, played a couple others that I wasn't too hot on. I haven't played like his last couple, um, but some friends in my group haven't liked them. But anyway. But I would definitely say, if you're like, ooh, I don't really like art gallery stuff, uh, take a look at Vinos, excellent game. It's about uh, you know running a vineyard, and it's, it's, it feels very much in the same kind of vibe as this um, with some cool things. And I would get the new edition of Vinos as well, because it has like two game modes that you can play in. And then CO2 is a completely different thing. It's like a co-op now in the second edition. Uh, so, but it, that's... I would hate to compare that to this because they're not really in the same ballpark. I would say get this, or if you you know don't want art gallery stuff, take a look at Vinos because that's more of a traditional Euro, like you know, you're growing your wine and all that kind of stuff. And um, but this one, the player count, I like to set all the player count two, three, four. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna look at the boxes before I say, but I think it's gonna be two to three hours. What's the box say? Uh, the box says somewhere. It doesn't say. No, oh, there it is. Hang on. 120 minutes, two hours. Hmm, maybe. Yeah, you could you could get on in two hours, definitely with two players. Uh, four players that know the game, I think you can get it done in less than three hours, maybe. But I'd say two to three hours for this one. Anyway, this is a very, very interesting game. Uh, good thematically. You know, a lot of times people look at these heavy Euros, always bugs me. They look at this heavy cruncher Euro and they're like, it's not thematic. It's not. There's no theme because I I have to use my my brain. God, I'm being so snarky. I don't care. I have to use my brain. I have to use my brain so much, so it's not thematic. Like, oh my gosh! Yes, this is. This is super thematic. Way th just as thematic as like any of these Ameritrash games. Super thematic. Now again, the one mechanic where you get bumped out. Not super thematic. 
I can go look at any of these other Meritrash or Euro games and pick out a mechanic that's not super like there, but it holds the design together. This is super thematic to me. Uh, and, and I think this is why this one gets pushed up you know, above Venus and stuff like that, which are still, Venus has got a really cool thematic stuff too with the whole wine fair and that, the way that works is really neat. But this is a very big, crunchy, heavy, you know, thinky Euro, super thematic, 100%. So that's the gallerist, number 13. We're gonna go into uh, number 12 over here. And these next two games, now we've switched themes now. We went from lots of minis and Ameritrash stuff, and now we've switched over to really heavy, crunchy Euros that are also thematic, like Great Western Trail. So Great Western Trail here is number 12. This came out two, two, three years ago. This is, I think, my game of the, this, well, I know. It was my game of the year for whatever year it came out. And uh, this is cool. This is, uh, it's, it's, you're going through, uh, you know, from Texas up to Kansas, and you've got your Russell and your cattle, and you're moving up through the Great Western Trail. And along the way, you're buying and selling cattle, you're investing in buildings and starting up your own little businesses along this trail to sort of you know milk money out of that uh, that whole shipping lane so to speak and then you're doing like a deck building thing out of the uh, out of the cards of the cattle that you're going to get and so you're trying to build up a variety of cattle to uh, you know sort of generate more money once you hit Kansas City and then you're going to restart over and you know make the trail again kind of buying and selling cattle and and next time you go through the trail there's going to be more businesses your friends or your opponents are gonna have businesses out there. You're gonna to have to pay them money sometimes as you go through. It's gonna kind of get in your way and slow you down. And then you're just kind of cycling through and moving up different tracks and, and, and interacting with the railroads and stuff like that. Um, a really excellent game. This is a, a very, very good game. One of my most favorite Euros uh, that's out there. Um, I find this very thematic uh, atmospherically a little bit differently than what I just talked about with the gallerist. Like the deck building part of this doesn't really fit, I don't think, because it's just, I don't know, it feels a little, because once you get to Kansas City, the idea is to have a hand of one of each different most valuable cattle. So if I show up with a bunch of cattle, then it's not as good because I can't score those, which it kind of makes sense because you're kind of, you want to show up with more cattle and you want certain choice meats, I guess. So it kind of makes sense, but because you're like discarding stuff, it, that can kind of be a little bit of a breakdown of mechanic wise. Um, and then the way that you push down uh, your little train track, what is that? You're just pushing this down and like scoring bonuses and stuff and getting little things. But the mechanical side of that outweighs that because it's got lots of cool stuff going on. The deck building's neat. The way that you can throw down your own businesses is neat and get people's way and mess with their route. And then you can, there's like different little shortcuts and things that you can go through, but there might be hazards there. And you can sort of specialize and have higher different types of workers and things like that. And it just is a very, I think the, the weird thing about this one is the actual like physical activity of what I'm doing. I'm moving my stuff around and all that stuff. That whole thing is super satisfying because you're on this trail. It's like you're sending this guy on this little journey and he's doing his thing. He's visiting this place. He's visiting Billy's place. Billy sucks because he took two bucks from you. You know, you're going down here. There's a hazard here. You've got to go tra trade with some Native Americans. And then you've got to, you know, go deal with these people and deal with these people. Um, you know, and then you're in the whole time you're like deck building. You know, you're like trying to fine tune your deck and get the, that perfect thing. So it's like, oh, this, this timer, you're on this like railroad or this uh, roller coaster thing, J -j 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 you're going up the thing. And then once you get to the top and you're about to go down and drop into Kansas City and score a bunch of points and get a bunch of money. So it's like this timer that you have some control over because you can move it at certain speeds, you know, each, uh, each round and you activate your little player board and start to unlock abilities. So it's, just has that it's just a perfect kind of like engine building kind of thing where you're just you're slowly like cranking this over and over and over and each time you go around you know up from texas to kansas city and all this stuff then uh you know you, you can just kind of feel your business your little company or whatever growing um in a mechanical way i think more than a thematic way but it still has that smell and that atmosphere of the theme oh incidentally i keep talking about the theme of it 
if you go listen to, there's a Longview episode that they just did. They're doing this new thing about the um, a board game. Oh gosh, a board game backstory. And uh, they talked about the history of the Great Western Trail, like what the actual uh, game was based on and some of the theme. And so it, it actually, some of the decisions they made uh, during this and like how you can trade with the Native Americans and the different types of cattle and uh, the biz businesses along the route and stuff actually makes more thematic sense. Now, none of that necessarily I got picked up when I played the game uh, before listening to that podcast, but that's a good little podcast to go listen to to kind of like augment your play of this. And I'll put a link to that here. Uh, but yeah, so definitely uh, definitely listen to that too. But this is just an amazing, uh, amazing, amazing game. One of my favorite Euros. And just a lot of times these Euros, they have like a mishmash of mechanics. And it's like, whoa, they just threw the kitchen sink. And they kind of did that with this. But for me, this just works perfectly. Now the other oh, player count, we'll talk about a mm, yeah, I wouldn't really play this two player. It's I guess it's okay. I don't know. Three, you got it three and four. I'd play it three, four all day long. It's gonna take you about two hours. Once everybody knows how to play the game. And because I just, it's just not enough happening with two players. It's just, there's not enough going on. <laughs> I need some other players to compete with and to sort of keep my brain occupied with this one. So I like the extra players there. Uh, you know, about two hours, like I said earlier. Uh, the other game I'd throw on here, and this this one is on the top 100, just not in the top 50, and that's Gaia Project, which is like the sci-fi um, Termistica. I really like that game. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a good game. It's in space, you know, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> it's, it's got this really crunchy and brain chewy. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a little bit more of the mechanic than the theme. Although it's got some nice themey stuff to it in Gaia Project, so it's kind of like this. So I just think I just got to get into this, you know, more realistic theme in this case, uh, a little bit more. So that's Great Western Trail number 12. And then we have the last one today, keeping with our current theme. This is number 11. And this box is heavy because I packed it full of stuff. Hang on. It is actually really heavy to pick up. And this is brass, not this edition. This is brass Lancashire. But I got rid of my brass Birmingham box because I like this cover. And I have both games in here, but Brass Birmingham specifically is the the one that I like. Now I will play Brass Lancashire too if somebody really wanted to play that. Absolutely, uh, Brass Birmingham is the new edition of Brass, the new board and new mechanics and new deck of cards and all that stuff. Come out last year? Was it last year? I think it was last year. Yes, it was, and I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it more than Lancashire uh, easily. I still like Lancashire a lot, uh, but this adds some new elements to it where you have, if you're not familiar with brass, you've got card play. Uh, you're playing different types of cards to build different industries and uh, or discarding them to pay for things like building tracks and things. So it's got that whole multi-use card thing, which I talked about. Uh, I haven't talked about it in today's video, but I've talked about it a lot in the last couple of videos. And I, you know me, I'm a sucker for that. And it has this kind of thing where you can leech off other people's industries to a certain extent. And you are really sort of muscling around trying to build industries that other players need to use so they can use your version of that industry and not somebody else's or the game's version of the industry. And you might need iron or coal or, um, or, or barrels of beer in this case. And that will help you to sort of upgrade and flip these different buildings that you'll put out in these industries to score you points and give you income and stuff like that. So you're, again, this is a very much like, it's strategic, but it's strategic in a way that is reactive. Now, typically when you think reactive, you think tactical. You know, you do this, I do that. But you can do it in a certain way that you're like, this is my strategy. I'm gonna try to be um, the coal guy or the, the iron guy. Or, or whatever, and not worry too much about shipping. But then on the side, I'm gonna sort of dabble in this other little business when I need to. But I'm really gonna go for this because this is a way to kind of build a little bit of an engine that other players are gonna help me build, <laughs> even though they necessarily don't want to do that. And so you have this, you're sort of playing and you're bouncing off the other players. And that's just really neat. Um, and it's, it's a little difficult to describe the game without, I don't know, we're probably like an hour into this video now, but I did do a video review of it. And there's been a lot of reviews on this actually. So if you want to see how the game works mechanically and you're not familiar, go find a video review and look at it. Because it's very, very simple 
core mechanic. Very simple, honestly. But like what is a good play is not, 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 not very simple. And it took me several plays uh, of the original brass uh, to really come to terms. I always had fun when I played it, but after playing it a while, then you start to sort of, and I haven't played this frankly in a couple of months and like my brain, I, I wouldn't be good at it next time I played. I need to play it once or twice to get back into it. Uh, so it's, this is one of those games that like you could keep around for years and years, I think, because if you take a break from it, you know, some of that stuff's going to go out the window unless you refresh your, your memory. And it's got that nice, um, tactile, not tactical, but tactile gameplay of using the multi-use cards. What do I spend? You know, what do I discard? Do I keep this for a later turn? Because if Billy builds that, then I could build this and this would be good, but maybe I should just discard it to pay for this other thing right now. And that whole kind of visceral thing. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's got this whole thing where you're playing around everybody. Uh, so, Let's talk about player count with this. Now this version here, as well as the new Lancashire version, they have uh, new modes and rules for two players. It used to only be a three player game. I would recommend it with two players, all the way up to three and four players. I would easily play this in any player count. I had a chance to actually play this uh, two player last year at Gen Con and had a blast and I was very surprised. Um, you know, and uh, Roddy Smith from Watch It Played, he was, he was gonna do a video on it. And he's like, let's play Brass, you know, because he wanted to get another play of it in. And I was like, yeah, I was like, two player? And then I looked, and I'm like, oh, there's two player rules? And I was like, okay, let's, you know, well, this will just be fun. We're just kind of, for me, relearning the game and him kind of freshening up. And then we played it and it was like, what? That was awesome. <laughs> like, that was actually worked, that worked perfectly. And so I would definitely, definitely, definitely play this with two. It's a little bit more interesting with three and four because then you're able to bounce off more things and that just it keeps your, your brain a little bit more active that way um, but with two players still it's still really good because there's some scaling that happens with the different uh, maps and the cards and stuff that you take out but it still scales really nice um, and then I want to mention one other game here and then I want to talk about another aspect of it in terms of Birmingham why it sets it apart from Lancashire. Uh, the other game I would mention with this along this would be uh, Underwater Cities which is a new game that came out last year that I really ha uh, had a good time playing and it has a similar thing where you're kind of uh, you're growing your little city and building your little engine and stuff like that and it has some very different kind of scorings and different little weird quirks and stuff that I think, uh, you know, if you're playing one of these newer Euros from the last couple of years, uh, Underwater Cities would be one that I would recommend because it's got some interesting card play, kind of like Brass, where you're kind of discarding cards that match a color for a worker placement kind of thing, and then sort of comboing that with some different abilities and stuff. So it's got that whole multi-use card thing going on, and then it's also this interesting economic Euro thing, which is kind of cool. Um, but they're not really, One's more of a Euro, which would be Underwater Cities, and Brass is more of a economic game with some Euro stuff in it. So that's that. But then the last thing I want to mention about Birmingham is a very neat thing, and it kind of it kind of just doubles down and hones in and zeroes in on what makes the Brass sort of engine so good. And, you know, there's been the Age of Industry with lots of different maps, the original Brass, the new Brass, and what really brings it home in Birmingham is the whole delivery of the beer barrels. So, you know, what happens is, it's like, okay, so I'm shipping goods to these different ports. I need the, the coal and the iron to go on the train tracks and, and build certain buildings as the building materials. So those industries are kind of fired up and the industrial revolution starts to heat up and all this stuff happens. So you have these sort of coexisting industries that are very dependent on each other. And you know, one part of the economy does well, so the other part of the economy does well. And you see that nowadays, right? So if you know, you're building computers, then you need lots of lithium batteries and you know, stuff like that. So you have all these sort of intermingled economies. And then in this one, they throw in uh, the beer barrels. And you're like, hmm, why does the beer barrel <laughs> need the full of beer not just the barrel but why does beer all of a sudden have a place in the industrialized world and it's like oh yeah because all these employees that i'm paying 
to do this work. They're doing great work. They're mining for me. They're getting on the trains. They're shipping stuff. You know, they're organizing that. And they're filling out the ledgers and all that. And I'm paying them to do that. That's nice. I would also like that money back. So I'm going to open up a pub. And then I'm going to sell them beer. And then they're going to give me the money I just paid them back. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. <laughs> this is a game about capitalism. I'm not making a judgment. I'm just saying. <laughs> that happens. So it's like, oh, Mr. Uh, Billy Bob there. He's got his little industry going. Da -da 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 -da, but I'm going to open up a grocery store. <laughs> and then I'm going to collect that money back. <laughs> and that stuff totally happens. And I was like. Ah, yeah, this is good. I like this little this little wrinkle in here, this little thing, because you got to get these barrels shipped off, and and you got to you got to it's this this resource of food or drink that that needs to go along and go along and, and happen and get shipped out and all this stuff. Because you don't actually ship the beer, you just have to spend it. You have to pay it, and it's like. But then you, you know your building flips over because you you've upgraded your your thing and you've used the resource, so you're not just shipping beer which would probably make more obvious sense, I guess. But it's just like, oh, well, you need beer now for this. And I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's weird. I don't understand that. And then I thought about it and I was like, oh yeah, he's getting the money back <laughs> that he gave his employees. And I'm like, this is cool. I like this. This is, how, this is how the system works. Anyway, so that is number 11, Brass Birmingham. Definitely any of the brass games is fine. So there we go. Last one coming up. And then, uh, yeah. So have fun. Thanks.